Well, we're very happy to welcome you as the Christ Journey family gathers once again, not only here in Coral Gables in our house, but wherever you're connecting with this church online in your house, and we're inviting God's blessing upon you. And in our house today, we are celebrating the arrival of the Christ child. We're counting down the days, but today we're doing it by dedicating ourselves, our families, our parents in the arrival of new additions in their lives. So church family, could we once again just give it up and ask God's blessing for everyone of the families and the little ones that have been presented today and the families that are dedicating on their behalf. Amen. Amen. And if you're a guest with us today, thank you. You honor us with your presence. We're so grateful that you're here and we pray that you will take away some inspiration and some hope and perhaps some reason to maybe come again. We're very happy that you're with us today. A um, couple other real quick updates that I need to give. Thank you to the many of you that were praying 24 hours. We had a 24 hour prayer vigil around the clock this week in anticipation of a zoning appeals board meeting. And at that meeting, the zoning appeals board decided to defer our Sunset Drive proposal decision until January 5th. So our prayers continue. Let's invite God's blessing upon all of those board members, upon all of the neighbors around the Sunset Drive, and upon every person and part that has brought us to this point in that journey. But there's the brief update there. So thank you for your prayers. And then also, I got an early Christmas gift this week. The scholars, we have a group of scholars from Oxford University who will be coming to be with us from the Oxford Center of uh, Christian Apologetics, and they confirmed just this week that they'll be with us January the 21st for an all-day Saturday conference on dealing with some of the issues that we face in our world. So I wanted to say thank you, God. That's like an early present that he has brought into us, and we want to share that with everybody who can connect to us. So, but our series continues to ask the question, what does it take to give the perfect present. And the last time we were together, we understood, okay, it starts by taking time and giving thought. You take time and you give thought to the person that's going to be receiving this gift that you want to be the perfect present. Okay, what do they love? What do they like? What do they want? What, what's their size? What's their color? You know, what, what would they truly need? What would they truly appreciate? And so we start by giving time to take some thought, and then came to understand that God did the very same thing when it came to that first Christmas gift. The perfect present for us would be the gift of himself. The truest answer to all that we truly want, truly need, truly love, and would truly appreciate that God knows that at our core, we are spiritual beings, which means that nothing less at being made in God's image, nothing less than God himself can bring the satisfaction that we are intended to have ultimately in him. C.S. Lewis was an Oxford professor, also from Oxford University, but he said this once upon a time. He said, God made us, which means he invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, gas-powered car, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel that our spirits were designed to burn or the food that we feed upon. So the, the vehicle is us and the fuel is God and he wants to see that we have the perfect present given to us and that's where Christmas came from. So for God to give us the perfect present, he could not give us anything less than himself. Which is what the Bible says God chose to do. One of the things we saw last week was that all through time the prophets predicted that he would come. Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, said this, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so what we saw was that God took time, and he gave thought all through the history that we have recorded 
from the beginning, through the prophets, to the very time that Jesus Christ was born, and even before the creation, before the creation of the cosmos, the scripture says that God, before he ever said, let there be light, he had already chosen us in Christ to say, I will be there in love for you. But if it takes time and requires thought to give the perfect present, then the next question that comes to me is this one. How am I going to pay for it? You know, you, you take the time, you think about the person that you really want to give the perfect present to, and the next question for me is, can I afford it? <laughs> you know, I've identified it. Now, how am I going to pay for it? you got to be able to pay for it. I remember um, when I asked Lisa to marry me, and she graciously accepted. I was so thrilled about it, but I wanted her to have the perfect present. And, of course, you know the perfect present for a newly engaged woman is what? It's a ring, yeah, get a clue, Bill. And so I had to figure out, how am I gonna pay for that? Because at the time, I was living in a garage apartment and I was serving as the youth director for a very small church in Oklahoma. And I wanted it to be something special so that when she would look at it or anybody else would look at it, then they would immediately think, oh, she's loved. You know, I, that's what you want the gift to be, the perfect gift. And, but on my youth ministry salary at the time, I'm telling you, there's not a lot of margin there. So I had to figure out, what am I going to do about this? Well, I concluded I'm going to have to make payments. So that meant that I was going to have to save up some money for a while. Where am I going to get the payments? Well, I started skipping meals. This is a true story. I skipped meals every day, every week, several months, and I saved up that money so that I could make the payment on the perfect gift. I skipped, I skipped groceries, I skipped pizza money, I, I skipped eat out money. Every spare coin that I could find you know, went toward paying for that ring, the things you do for love. But that's what we're talking about here. And a few years ago, not, not years ago, well yeah, I guess it is now, just a few years ago, Lisa and I were privileged to be with a group of Christ journeyers in Cana, Israel. And uh, we renewed our marriage vows at the site where Jesus performed the first miracle in turning the water into wine. And guess what we did? We had taken the original gold from the original ring and the original stone that we had, and then we added more gold and more stones and melted it all down and had a jeweler to create just the perfect present that would say to her, in the presence of God, by the miracle of his grace, I love you. The perfect present. But once you've found the perfect present, here's what you, the next question is, how I gotta pay for this? You gotta pay for it. Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't skip any meals to cover the cost on that. <laughs> but my heart was full of love and thrilled to be able to make that presentation with people that mattered to us very much. Once you've found it, there's a cost factor involved. You've got to figure out, how am I going to do it? We just celebrated parent dedication. Those of you joining us online that will be watching this time future are going to remember that this was a day when we had parents step up and to dedicate themselves to giving all that they can to help their children grow, to have opportunities that perhaps they haven't had yet, or they want to make sure that they get the best opportunity they can in life. And as a church family, so likewise, we came alongside that, and we want to ask God's blessing upon that. But i got to tell you, those little perfect presents that God places in our hands, these little perfect bundles of potential, they don't come cheap, right? United States Department of Agriculture listed this as in answer to my query, what does it cost to raise a child in the United States from the time they're born to the time that they graduate from high school? This is high school, not college, okay? You know what they said? $310,605 United States. That's $17,000 a year without college. Maybe I should have said to the parents first, you know, close your eyes, you know, don't. <laughs> and parents do what about that? You know what they do? They step up. They say, we're in. They do what we just saw. Why do we do that? So that their kids might have opportunity beyond whatever came their way. Why do they do that? Because of love. 
the things you do for love. This is the perfect present that they want to present to their little gift is to say, Lord, as you bless us, we will bless them. And our church family is here to say, and we feel privileged and honored to be on, on the same journey with you so that we can join you in that and invite God's blessing, not only to find us, to find our church family, but to be multiplied through the generations that God is gracing us with. But that perfect present takes time and thought. And then <laughs> you gotta be able to pay for it. You gotta count the cost, you gotta be willing to do what it takes to see that it's landed. Now, would you be surprised if I told you that's exactly what God does, this is what the scripture tells us, so that he could get you and me the perfect present that very first Christmas. In fact, without this gift, there would be no Christmas. This is the birthday that we celebrate that brings us what God has for us. And so the question today is, what did it take God? What did it cost God to get you and me the perfect present? And we saw last week that he gave time and thought to it, but now he's got to answer the question, am I gonna, how am I going to pay for this? And did you know the Bible gives us a chapter that answers that very question? It's Philippians chapter 2. And just a few verses there describes this mystery that is beyond our grasp and yet within our reach to appreciate. It speaks of Jesus and says this, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing and, and taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in the human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and then became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, in those brief words, we see this unfathomable descent from infinite almighty God, from timelessness in eternity, entering in and stepping down so that Christmas could find its way to you and to me. In very nature, God is where it begins, and yet he releases his very nature. You're going to have to invite your mind to think into this for a second, but it's, he doesn't keep holding on to it. You know, people fight for equality in our world, in our culture. And we believe equality matters a lot. And yet the first thing God does when he thinks about bringing Christmas to us is he says, I'm going to let go of equality. In order for us to have the perfect present, God sees first that it's going to cost him giving up his own equality. That God is going to have to let go of something that has been essential to his godness. And his godness will never be the same because he's giving it up. It's first step down. After choosing the path of release, then what does God do? It says that he empties himself out. He, he makes himself nothing. That word simply, it really means he pours himself out. How did God get Christmas to Bethlehem and then to you? Well, first, he... Uh, he chooses the path of release, and then next he pours himself, he empties himself out. What had defined God? And theologians write volumes about this, trying to understand. But it says his essential godness to that point, he, pour, he chooses to pour out. He empties of himself. God essentially dies to himself. We hear the New Testament say you need to die to yourself. Well, God does that at the outset here. The intrinsic value that had defined God through eternity past, he lets it go, and then he pours it out. It's like after he embraces the thought in his mind, what does it take to give the perfect present? It takes time and thought. God takes time, he gives it thought, and then he displaces himself, empties himself to do what? Third step down, take the form of a servant. Now, there's another word that's offensive to us. That's just somebody who belongs to somebody else. 
A servant is someone who belongs to another. By definition of this Greek word, it says they have no ownership rights over themselves. That's, that's what he's saying. No rights of their own. And so this word is also used in the New Testament of believers who willingly live under Christ's lordship as fully devoted followers. I mean, they're in and they're serious and they're going the distance. It's a term of highest quality and dignity for us to demonstrate that as God first modeled it so that we might have the gift. God becomes our servant and he gives himself to belong to us. Think about it for a moment. God wants to belong to you. That's what that means. How did Christmas get to you? Well, God said, I'd love to belong to you. So what was the fourth step? Having been made in likeness of men, now we're to the angel Gabriel's announcement to Mary, and then nine months later, the delivery of the birth in Bethlehem. Made, born, made in the likeness of men, being born as one of us. Infinite, almighty God, now giving to the full expression of his godness, poured out in human form. This is another mystery. 100% God, in poured into 100% human. More about this next week. But that still wasn't the full price. You know, if you got the perfect present, then you got to pay for it. And how does God cover the cost for this? Step five, he humbled himself to live an obedient life, an obedient human life. He fully submits himself as God the Son to the obedient will of God the Father. And in fact, Jesus says this, you know, I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say the things that I hear my Father saying. I'm here to do my Father's will. So not my will, but thy will be done. So he lives this uninterrupted life of fellowship and uh, connectedness in spiritual intimacy and oneness with his Father. And in doing that, step six becomes obedient to death. I mean, there's nothing more he could have done, right? The last full measure of devotion, and he takes the step. Oh, wait, <laughs> there is one more step, one more step down. Do you know what it is? It says death on a cross. Historians tell us this is the most agonizing, humiliating, shameful of deaths. The Romans wouldn't even let their citizens be crucified. If you're a Roman citizen, that's something you never had to worry about. Capital punishment by crucifixion. It's not going to happen. They saved it for the scum of the earth in their minds. Enemies of the state and violent criminals. How much did Christmas cost God? This is a profound mystery. But somehow God emptied his wallet completely. I mean, he drained his account and put it all out there to make it happen. For God to become infinite, almighty God, to become human and then give himself on a cross involved an essential disintegration, a disintegration of God with his own godness. Now, sometimes we mistakenly, we mistakenly believe that there are three gods, that there's God the Father, he's out there, there's God the Son, he was right here, and then there's God the Spirit, who's kind of everywhere. But we see three gods. No, no, no. This is part of the mystery. There are not three gods. There is one God who reveals himself in three persons. But the reason that matters here is because Father God wasn't out at a distance looking down on Bethlehem and going, oh my, what a cute baby. No, that he was, the, he was fully occupying the son, God the son's expression of himself, making himself known. This is what Colossians 2 says. The fullness of the Godhead was in bodily form. The fullness, all the godness that there was of God. He poured himself into the Christness of Jesus. Why? 2 Corinthians 5, God was reconciling in Christ. God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, putting the broken pieces of life, the broken pieces of hearts, the broken pieces of homes, the broken promises that are made, all the brokenness of sin. He's putting those pieces back together. 
and not counting people's sins against them. God in Christ, as Jesus Christ was born in that cradle to die on that cross. That's what this is about. And God's will, not, but not because of self-will, not because of self-will, not because of self, not self-centered, not self-defined, not self-absorbed. There is no narcissism in Christ. He is self-surrendered and he is self-controlled that he might live fully in the Father's will. God the Father was revealing himself in God the Son by God the Spirit's power saying, not my will, but thine be done. That's how Christmas came here. Why did he do it? Well, one answer is for justice and mercy. Justice and mercy. God knew in his godness that his, that his holiness would never be satisfied. We could never cover the cost for our own sins. We don't have the resources. We can't do that. The cost is too much. Paying full penalty is more than we can bear. So what does he do? Here's this gospel story. God takes on a body so that he can die. He takes on a body as one of us so that he can die for every one of us. The wages of sin is death, but God says, I'll cover that. I'll take that into myself. And then he went all the way down the elevator shaft to the deepest hell to leave no sin unpaid or uncovered. This is amazing. Because as, as we understand, when you stop to think about it, no sin done can be undone. Sin once done can't be undone. You can't unsay those words. You can't undo that deed that you did. We can't pay our own sin debt. Not really. Human courts in this regard are, uh, are like a shadow of true justice where we get to say, something's wrong. Something needs to be made right. But then we also feel so helpless because we can't undo much of the deeds that have done such damage. Once they're done, they can't be reversed. It's like a bell can't be, you can't unring a bell. You can't unscramble eggs. We say we want justice. We do, but we don't have what it takes to do pure redemptive justice. But God's holy love does full justice in himself, then offers mercy from the price wholly paid. So here's what that means. Practically speaking, mercy doesn't mean that you got away with it. Mercy doesn't mean, oh, hey, I got away with it. No, it doesn't. It means you got found out. You got found out, and then you got in trouble, and then you realize that you don't have what it takes to pay for it, but God does. And God already did. And God wants to deliver the payment with nail-scarred hands that went from the cradle to the cross because of you. That's how Christmas gets to us. Mercy doesn't mean you get away with something. Mercy means that you realize you can't undo it, not really, and yet God has what you need to address. And so he offers forgiveness and freedom so healing can begin and love can do what only love can do. That's what this means. And what can love do? Love opens the door to a new future. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus tells one of those little stories that he was famous for. He's talking to a guy named Simon, who's a Pharisee. And uh, he tells him this story. Okay, there was this man, and he loaned money to two people. He loaned 500 pieces of silver, $500, we'd say, to one, and he loaned $50 to another. But as it turns out, neither of them could pay. So he kindly forgave both of them, and just canceled their debts. So Jesus asked Simon, who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon said, I suppose <laughs> the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. And then Jesus turned to the woman that Simon had been judging, knowing that he was also judging Jesus for having anything to do with her, and then he says to Simon, after looking at the woman, this woman, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little only shows a little love. 
Only little love comes from less forgiveness. And then Luke says that the story, the people watching this happen, you know, it raised questions. I don't know if you agree with that logic, that story, but, you know, the people watching, it says they started asking this question, what kind of man forgives sin? And, of course, the Bible answer is the God-man from Christmas. The Christmas man does. That's the answer. The Christmas man does. And he brings with him (laughs) forgiveness enough to cover every sin for all of time and every person, no matter what debt you believe you have or don't have, that he's got it covered. Forgiveness enough for all of us, and then he wants us to live in his forgiveness. So this is the true Christmas spirit. Forgiving one another. Not because we deserve it, not because of anything except that God in Christ has done full justice and now extends mercy and says, I'd like for you to live in my forgiveness. And the New Testament makes it really clear. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other. But if you're a guest with us today, may I just speak to Christ your ears for a second because he's just talking about the way that church people are supposed to treat church people. He says, be kind to each other. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And then Colossians 3 says something similar. He says, make allowance for each other's faults. Honey, are you listening? Oh, wait, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry, I was just thinking it. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. That's so offensive, isn't it? Think about that. It's like, who does that? Well, that's what Jesus says, oh, I do. And I'd like for you to join me in doing this. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And we forgive out of the riches of his forgiveness, not out of our own goodness. We make opportunity for mercy to triumph because justice had been done. And this is how Christ followers are supposed to follow Christ in a world full of disappointments where mistakes get made against us, we make mistakes on others, and and the world is watching and needs to be able to see the difference that the cross of Christ makes. What does that mean? We just live Christmas. That's that's what's supposed to happen here. The Golden Gate Bridge, maybe you've been there. It's one of the the, uh, iconic landmarks in uh, Northern California, beautiful bridges the gap across San Francisco Bay. Um, These are some early pictures of its construction. It's a major major transportation link in our own country, but it's also a world-class destination site um, for travelers. And so I was looking back on its beginnings, and I was, I guess I was surprised to find out there was so much controversy surrounding it. I mean, people were upset about it, there was rancor, there was disappointment, there was uh, public disputes and disagreements and, you know, legal matters were coming of it. And then I found this story, it was more surprising than that to me, that local citizens put up their own properties as collateral to finance the construction. And the voters of six counties in Northern California went to the polls in 1930, and they voted on whether or not to put up their own homes, their own farms, and their own business properties as collateral for a $35 million bond issue to finance construction of that new bridge. Do you know that? Some felt like the timing of the vote was really economically reckless. You know why? Because it was 1930 and that's the Great Depression. This was happening during the Great Depression. And they felt it was reckless because it was going to create bonded indebtedness in the Great Depression. And yet when the votes were counted, they were three to one in favor of doing it. And so I want to say that this beautiful bridge is here today because people that you and I don't even know were willing to put up the collateral. They had skin in the game. That wasn't government funding that that covered that. These are citizens, these are people like us, business owners. They had skin in the, they personally got involved in sharing the risk so a bridge could be built. Now they didn't build the bridge (laughs) and they didn't finance the bridge. No, not completely. Christmas, 
But they were there so that it could happen. Christmas is like that. Once again, let me talk to believers for a second here. Thank you for being here as our guest, but let me talk to the church just for a second. You know, we didn't build the bridge that Christmas brings. Only God and his resources can do that. But he did it all. He did all the heavy lifting. He did all the deep pocket financing. He was, he was in it all the way so that Christmas could happen, covering all costs so that God could come meet us in Christ and we would have the perfect present in himself. He covers all those costs. And yet, you know the verse right before the one that I introduced to you? Paul says, now believers, let this mind be also in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes into that downward staircase He's like, he's saying, hey, Christ follower, you got to have skin in the game here. I want to invite you to take a little collateral risk so that Christmas could find you. Let this mind be in you so that the, Christ, the, the risk that made Christmas happen can now find its way to your home and to your life as well. So here's the question. Is there a relationship in your life that would be different if you let forgiveness reach it? How can you do that? Well, let's just back up to what we saw God do. First, there's got to be a choice to release. You choose the path of release. You disrupt the status quo of unforgiveness. I'm not going to hold on to my equality. I've got to open it up. Second step, empty yourself. Let go of your rights. The right to hold on to that injury, to your pride to hold on to the hurt. Second thing you get, you know, third, take the form of a servant. Offer yourself to belong in relationship with the other person. Next, he says, clothe yourself in your finest humanity and then put the, bra the drawbridge down so that the way could be made clear for the opportunity to happen. Then what? Well, then obey Jesus. You know, the purpose of our church, we say, is to help people find and follow Christ. All you do next is just follow Jesus. What he did, then you do. Just do that. Forgive. Humble yourself in obedience to forgive as you've been forgiven. He said, freely you've received. Now, freely give. Next what? Obedient to death. Oh, this is no fun. No, but it's very freeing. You deny yourself. You die to yourself. You say, I am crucified with Christ, but Christ lives in me, and I'm going to let my pride die. And then it's death on a cross. You receive by faith what Christ did on your behalf and re relieve, and allow him to start living in you as you release the injury and now bring healing through you right into that broken, hurting place. I don't know what place that is for you, but I know God does, and he's wanting to restore relationships as an expression of the perfect present of Christmas. Hmm. The poet got it right when they wrote, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, and were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. And nor could the scroll contain the whole if written from sky to sky. Now back up to the bridge a second more. Uh, estimates are 40 million cars travel across that bridge every year, annually. Multiply that out over the 85 years of its existence. You've got billions and billions and billions and billions of people who have benefited because of that bridge and because of those unnamed people who put up the collateral, who took the risk, who said, I'll, I'll put some skin in this game. And because they did, traffic from side to side has been allowed. I'm thinking also, you know, billions and billions more people have experienced the Christmas gift that God has given us in himself across that bridge from heaven to earth that reached to us in Bethlehem and then on the cross. And that perfect present has come to you with all costs covered that you might experience 
that payment in full and freedom forward. But I'm still wondering, how is that supposed to get to our relationships and to our hurt places? How is that the power of God's forgiving Christmas supposed to make it into your home? Well, I'm thinking somebody's got to put up some collateral. You don't pay the whole price. You can't. But you could take the risk of putting some skin in the game and saying, I'll welcome you, Jesus, into this part so that my part of giving my loved ones the perfect Christmas this year could happen. See, it takes somebody that's willing to take the risk. Is that somebody you? Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for the reflection upon the, the time and the thought that you've given and now the cost this unspeakable cost that you have paid that we might experience everything that Christmas means and that being related to you means. I need help with this one. Um, I don't want to give up my equality. I don't want to give up my hurt. Sometimes I'd just rather keep holding on to a grudge. But what I do want is for my wife and my family, for my kids, for my church, for my Lord, to be able to experience the perfect present this Christmas. And so, Lord, for me and people like me, right now, I'm willing and open to receiving your tender mercy and your kindness and your forgiveness so that my wife could and my kids could, and my grandsons could, and my church can, because you're doing the work. And I'm wondering if there's another brother here or another sister here who's in the same place I am and would say, I've held on to this for too long. Just want to let it go. And put the drawbridge down from my side of the road so that healing could come. Would you follow the Holy Spirit's lead in this, sister, brother? Take the risk. Invite his grace and mercy to meet you at the hurt place. And then just let it go. Perhaps today you've realized that God loves you and paid a whole lot more than you ever imagined so that you could have your chance to receive him as the perfect present. If you'd like to take that step, you can do it with me in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, I believe you love me, and I'm so thankful that you came for me, and I invite you to forgive my sins to come into my life and fill me with your presence and with your love. Teach me how to turn from going my way as I learn to go your way. And I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Now our heads still bowed just for a moment, but if you prayed that prayer with me and would let me ask God's blessing upon your next steps of faith forward, would you simply slip your hand up, hold it up for a moment so that I'll have a chance to see. And then if you're joining us online, you can just Put that right in the chat as well and let us pray with you there. Right here in the middle of the, of the room. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? Over to my right. All right, in the front. Thank you so much. God bless you, sister. Anybody else? It's hard for me to see sometimes in these lights, so amen. Toward the back in the center on my left. Thank you. Lord Jesus, for every person who's raised their hand, as a signal that their heart has been open to you. We pray that they would sense your presence and your peace, know the freedom that forgiveness brings, and feel the smile of your spirit lifting them as we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.